Hi, I'm Rohit Brijnath, Assistant Sports Editor with The Straits Times. And I'm Sazali Abdulaziz, Sports Correspondent with The Straits Times. Yeah, and both of us had the pleasure of speaking to Olympic champion Joseph Schooling, uh, who, of course, uh, won a gold medal in the 100 meter butterfly at the 2016 Rio Olympics, beating Michael Phelps. And uh, we had a terrific, uh, relaxed chat uh, with Joseph, who's spoken on a variety of subjects. Yeah, he spoke about times, life in the States, uh, and even national service. We hope you enjoyed the interview as much as we did. Hey, Joe, good to see you. And uh, I'm going to ask you a simple, straightforward question. Do you dream of gold ever? Um, I wouldn't say dream of gold. The only swimming dreams I have would be more or less some competitions, um, me in the pool, but never really winning a gold medal. Got any new tattoos? <laughs> no, no tattoos so far. <laughs> And even if, even if I did, I couldn't say it over here because mom and dad would have me without telling them. <laughs> okay. So that, I, I text you about it. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, fine. Last quick question I wanted to ask you because I think you guys are uh, living on your own and having to manage and, you know, it's, it's like everybody else locked down. Are you a better cook? Learn any new dishes? Yeah. Um, took some dishes from home uh, back to Christiansburg but mostly just simple dishes like pasta. Um, occasionally I'll cook a steak, you know, just very basic ones. My roommate's a great cook, so I've learned a lot from him. Okay, that's okay. lucky. Yeah. Joe, yeah. can you give us a, a breakdown of your, of your day, a typical day in the States? Is it a slog? You know, is it, uh, or, or you know, do you enjoy your routine? What, what's it like from, from the time you get up uh, till the end of your day? Yeah, so... I train eight sessions a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. We'd have singles, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, doubles. And I just do four out of the pool workouts, two dry lands, Tuesday, Thursdays, and weights on Mondays and Fridays. And then Sunday we have off. And my practice times, uh, I train around anywhere between two hours to on the high end, four, four and a half, almost five hours of workouts in a day on double and weight days. So yeah, I guess as Ali, you could say we're slogging it over here, but you know we got a great group. It's a lot of fun. Um, I'm enjoying my time over here with some people, and I couldn't be happier. Looks like you put on a little bit of muscle, man. Is that true, <laughs> or am I imagining things? Huh? I I've leaned up a little bit. I think you know we've okay. we had a we had some really good momentum going in from after lockdown um, into like I guess out of the pool workouts. It's at a good base, and right now I've kept. I kept the body um, trying to stay as lean as possible, but overall, I think cooking at home does help. You know, it was a pain at first, but the more you cook, the better it got. Okay, let's let's talk a little bit, you know, about timings. Okay, because swimming is the science of timings and trying to sort of get your timing to a particular point at a particular time, right? Just trying to. Yep. So your fastest time at the moment this year is fifty-two nine three. So what? Mm -hmm. How? What do we read into that? What does it 5293 mean? What are you looking at? How, how does timing work for you as a swimmer? What, how, what are you trying to do now? Yeah, that's a good question, Rohit. So although we're judged by the clock, the clock is everything in swimming, right? I think times right now I've learned at this stage are a bit redundant. You know, yeah, it, it can really play with your mind sometimes just because in the past things were a bit different. But at the same time, if you take a step back, I know the work I've put in, I know everything will come uh, at the Olympics. So right now it's just getting in the best possible frame of mind and really just enjoying the ride. You know, like there's no point really worrying about it. I know what I can do. I know I'm ready to go. And that's the most important thing. We just got to hit it at the right time. So 52.9, yeah, it's nice to get it. I was going 53 for so long. And it was just completely nuts. So getting under that 53, I guess, in a consolation way, was pretty nice. Okay, so this, this is a bit of a tough question to ask you, but, you know, is this life as an athlete? One of the things that happens to athletes, and I know Federer once spoke about this, is when you do great things, you become imprisoned by those great things, right? Those things become your sort of your standard, so to speak. So one of the things about your swim in Rio, apart from the fact that you won, was that your timing was fantastic, which was 50.39. 50, 50 mm -hmm. Is there a reason, I mean, it's a tough question. Is there a reason you haven't gone as fast as that for five years? 
Yeah, I think some of the things would have to be with changes. Um, after Rio for the next two, three years, I wasn't really motivated. You know, I think Sergio put it in a really good way. He said, your lifelong dream was to win an Olympic gold medal. But what happens after is just a bonus. So I really think it's quite relative. And it's really kind of like a frame of mind. But by the same token, the next two years coming in 2019, um, coming back to Singapore, it's just a huge change. I knew that was going to take time. And it was a tough period. I learned a lot of good lessons. And then coming to this year, I thought 2020 was okay. I was shaping up pretty well. And then the pandemic happened. Everything shut down. And like I've said, I've said this time and time again, the next year that we got, this past year has been terrible for so many people. But at the same time, like it was great for my swimming career, you know? So you got to take what life throws at you. And I'm really excited for this summer. So we'll see. Joe, obviously you've been based in, in the States for, for quite a while now. Um, you know, what about it, uh, what about it is, is just better for you? Is it the competition, you know, the environment as a whole? Uh, mm -hmm. you know, the coaches, you know, do you find more peace there than, than anywhere else? Yeah, you know, I think I'm just so used to training in the U.S. Like, I've spent half my life in the U.S., you know, and for most of that, that's the most of what I remember about swimming. That's the most I remember about school, and that's where I became an adult in, you know. So in the U.S. environment over here, um, I'm, com I'm very comfortable in. The people around are great. I'm really lucky to surround myself with or have good people over here, you know, like Jack, Yusuke, Farida. And Serge as a whole has done a really good job at piecing together like a great atmosphere. Yes, it's tough sometimes being away from home, but by the same token, you know, we're so close. We're so close to the Olympics and you can almost like, you can almost taste it. I'll be home in no time, but if I look back, I, I would have no regrets coming to the US, coming to Christiansburg. It's taught me so much. You know, there's an old saying, we're looking at all these old saying it's in sports or whatever, that it's easier getting to the top than staying at the top. That staying at the top mm -hmm. is a much harder thing to do, you know? Yeah. I want to know, what did you learn from winning gold and what has been hard? It's just given me such a greater appreciation for like long grades like Tiger, MJ, you know, athletes like that. It's how they stay at the top of their game for so long. Michael as well. I can't, I can't miss that name. So like, it, it's just given me such, it, it's given, it's warped my whole perspective of how there are different levels of greatness. And that kind of greatness is just, it, you know, it blows my mind. It's something to aspire for. It's, it's really cool. It's cool being in that position, but man, it is really something else. That's the number one thing that I've learned in the past five years. Unreal. What's the hardest thing you've learned from mm. winning gold? I think, like you said earlier in the interview, you know, it's about you've accomplished the highest feat at the highest level. So what then, right? And like you said, people that don't know me for who I am, like people that just know me for Joseph schooling this summer, like that, that form of identity will always hold me to like, that standard and if you perform substandard or you've been second at that level or third whatever it is it is deemed as a failure you know so i that i think internalizing that and accepting it and then growing from there has been the hardest part yeah like, like rohit mentioned and, and just to, to add on to what you you've just been saying about do, do you feel um, any pressure uh, on on mm -hmm. pleasing this this Singapore public that you know a lot of people are, are still very much in love with your you know 2016 win in, in Rio you know does it weigh on you uh, do people still write to you or DM you on on social media and you know sit, you know talk about Rio or you know give you like, messages of support or so on yeah of course um, there are definitely a lot of people still DMing me um, inboxing on Facebook just saying you know how they watched the race that day and how it made them feel like it's great. You know, the support is there. Like there are a lot of positive support. And if you have the higher, like I always like to say, the higher you achieve, the more criticism there is, right? The more haters you'll have, whether it's out of jealousy or they're unable to like warp their mind around like what you're trying to do. Like it's so as a multitude of reasons, you know? So yes, Sazali, there was like that expectation to live up to it, but the one that really got me was myself, you know, and it's, it's hard to be at the best 
for such a long period for all the time. It's not an excuse, it's a reality. So I think just letting go of those expectations, managing your internal expectations and really not caring about, I guess, not being results-based, you know, it, it's, it's kind of ironic because it is results-based, but you can't let that pressure weigh you down. So I think to cap that off, um, Tom Hardy, the actor has a really good quote. He says, if you, don't, if you don't have my phone number, that means you don't know me well enough to have an opinion of me because you don't know me, you know? <laughs> that, that might yeah, be nice. a little cutthroat. Yeah, that might be a little cutthroat, but come on, isn't it a little funny? But you, you actually seem to me, we haven't chatted for some time, uh, quite at peace with yourself, man. Like you found yeah. where you want to be. Would that be fair to say? Absolutely. You know, and it, it's been up and down, like everything in life. It's okay. But like I said, if I didn't have the people around here, didn't surround myself with the, these great people, uh, it, it'd be tough. You know, I, I really think you're a byproduct of the atmosphere. And I've just found my atmosphere. There's nothing much to this place. It's simple. You know, I think the nicest restaurant we have is like a, a Red Robin or a Red Lobster, you know, Texas Roadhouse. Like it, it's that kind of town, you know. But at the same time, I think it gives you a greater appreciation of what we have in Singapore. I think it gives you a greater appreciation of everything in life. Having to cook for myself, not taking for granted food on the table. Like I felt like I was almost expecting these things, you know. And that's that's not the kind of people I want to be. And that's, I definitely don't want to mix with people that are like that. Like, that's just not for me. Nice, nice. Okay, one more pressure question I got from you. Okay. One is, of course, that's uh, Zali asked you about the crowd expectation, uh, people expectation. The other thing is, look, one of the realities is it's possible. We don't want to project. I know you live in the present. Everybody else lives in the past or the future. But if you, if, you, if you don't win a medal, right, there's a possibility that you may not be granted further, you know, the deferment from national service. But does that sort of thing ever stay in your head? Or you say, no, man, I can control only what I can control and I'm just going to swim. Yeah. So the main point would be just focusing on what you can control, right? But obviously that's easier said than done. I'd be lying if I said things like that didn't pop into my mind. But at the same time, I think it's all about, it's all, it, it's all about perspective, and perspective being, okay, you can use that as pressure, but from a very objective and realistic point, that's the realities of life, right? I got to perform. And like, yes, me not meddling might be me going to the army after the Olympics because I don't meddle might be a byproduct of that. But if I don't meddle, like, man, there, I have to deal with my, you know, I have expectations of myself. Like those, those are more important to me than me having to go to the army for two years. Every male Singaporean has to go to the army for two years. So why should I be any different? I've just been given this gift of continuing swimming, making the most out of it, having a blast meeting great people while people go into the army. Like if I got to go in the army, I'll go in the army. That's fine with me. That's what I got to do. And after that, my path is clear, but most importantly, I don't want any excuses. I don't want any exceptions. If I got to do it, I got to do it. But right now I can control winning. And that's what I'm trying to do. The other guys who swim, right, like, you know, like tennis players, I know, will watch each other. Like, you know, if Nadal's playing a final, Federer will not watch the whole match, but he might sneak a peek for a couple of games or whatever, just to see how he's playing or whatever. Swimmers, do they watch each other? I mean, would you watch Christoph or watch, you know, Caleb Dressel if they swim or, you know, watch a tape of them or note their times or you just stay away from that sort of thing? Uh, I think it'd be a healthy balance. So yes, it's good to know where people are. You know, there, I go through some phases where I'm really neurotic about that. I go through some phases where I'm just more peace, more at calm right now. I think you can tell I'm at the calmer side of things. So I'm not really looking to that. I'm excited to watch my friends race at Olympic trials. The times are going to be a byproduct of that. It's going to be outcome of that. Whatever happens, happens. But at the mm. same time, I'm just enjoying the last 60 days I have over here. You know, yeah. like I'm trying to stay, I'm trying to stay in the moment and it, it's made me a lot happier. So yeah, I, it, I can go and I can unbox that, but it'll be for a different time. Do you have a time in your head that you're chasing? Yes, I do. But that time's only for me to know and my coaches to know. 
I don't, I don't know, know fair enough but we just I, yeah, I, but yeah I do okay no but yeah, there but there is a time in your head of course okay. you need to set goals okay. for yourself nice uh, can you tell us okay. how sergio gets you uh do, do you have examples of you know how he you know maybe understands you better or or differently than other people yeah i think for me serge there's so many okay serge would bring me back into the present so i can get really caught up with what we're doing um uh, should we do more should we do less like are we doing the right things like i can get really caught up with that sometimes especially midway through heavy training season um especially coming to certain races and i think he does a really good job at just leveling me um calming me reminding me like kind of changing my perspective towards certain things and the way i am now i really believe a big portion of it is because of surge of course you got great coaches here like payton subi that do a wonderful job back in the mop and it's been nice working with them too like i think it's a team it's really a team effort this is this is intriguing something because i always sense and i could be wrong about you that that you like a crowd i think you that you like mm-hmm. the show of sport as well that you know it's nice when there's this engagement and yeah. you know the noise and the atmosphere and it gives you a little charge in tokyo that's not going to be there you know in this sense is that tough for swimmers this thing that you know there is a very muted audience or you know i mean if there is audience or and even if there is it's very muted because it's not a full house does that affect somebody like you or you, or you guys too much in your own zone well of course i like to feed off the crowd you know that's a big part of sports right individual or not like sports is all about bringing people together getting 60 70000 people in the stadium going nuts so growing up that's your perspective of sports right so it's it's kind of hard to ignore it because it's inherent and on a professional level you can't let that affect you obviously so you need to prepare for it personally like i struggled at first i think it was kind of like rory i think rory said he was struggling with no crowds and then a crowd comes back and he just wins the last tournament like you know he feeds off that stuff like that guy grinds so yeah at the same at the same time i think having not having a crowd at tokyo isn't isn't going to affect anything we've been swimming with almost no crowds in the us except one florida meet and it's been hard at first but just keep getting better just got to adapt 